All right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to uh, some UCC review sessions S during message one review session. Uh, sorry, it's, it was a long day for me. I just had a quiz. So um, I'm pre-recording this one more time again, just because I'm having a surgery on Monday at 3 p.m. So I'll be probably quite swollen um, on Tuesday, so I won't be able to make it live on Tuesday. So I'll just go ahead and pre-record this and then we'll post it for you guys uh, so that you guys can have some shorts of material in order to review before your second exam for message one. I know you all very anxious and all want to do well. Um, just keep studying and try your best and um, whatever it happens, you already try your best, you know? With that being said, today I'm going to cover the three chapter musculoskeletal hematology and renal nursing care. So Professor Lanasa exam is very case study heavy based. Um, most questions are applicable questions, scenario type questions, and it's important that you guys understand the assessment findings, understand the keywords and the manifestation of each pathology in order to pick the correct answers. So I know that she already have the medication quiz, but sometimes she have a, a few um, assessment findings on like how to evaluate if this drug is effectively working, uh, something like that in the exam as well. So it's best to kind of know uh, overall of the, the biggest keys information from the medication as well of each chapter. Um, so I recommend you guys, if you guys haven't seen my uh, medication quiz video, like the second one, um, then I really recommend uh, to watch it uh, so that you guys can have uh, a grasp of what medication is going to be covered in these three chapters. And um, yeah, um, I will also link the Kahoot questions of uh, these three chapters in the description box below. So you guys can uh, practice and study from them, doing the questions from them. Uh, the questions were created by Sarah. Uh, she was one of the uh, uh, student in my cohort. Um, and I thought it was pretty good. So, um, so yeah, without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Okay, so osteomyelitis, we know this. Osteo is bone, myelitis. Itis is infection. So it's literally mean and bone infections. So with this one, the key information is the antibiotic therapy. Um, and it can be only treated by IV antibiotic only. Um, oral antibiotic will not work in this case. Um, and when we treat this, this disease, uh, osteomyelitis is needed to be treated for a long time, up to four to six weeks. And the most common medication, the most common antibiotic that we give to these patients are um, vancomycin. Uh, and like I mentioned before, any antibiotic that ends in CIN, C -I -N, is very uh, kidney toxicity. So vancomycin is not an exception. It is very toxic and can kill the patient kidney. It can shut the kidney down. And therefore we have to make sure when the patient on the vancomycin, we do the peak and trough level. It, this would tell us if there's too much medications in the patient blood. The, one of the most important medication uh, one of the most important is the peak and trough. Um, peak is uh, we measure the peak level after we give the, administer the drug and a trough level is before we administer the drug. So for example, we give, so the patient, he doesn't, he had no vancomycin in his blood yet. So we give him vancomycin, we don't have to take the trough level that time. However, after we, however, when we give him the vancomycin for the first time, we then check the peak level at like 30 minutes or one hour after the administration of the vancomycin to see if the, ther the level is in the therapeutic range. And after that, before we administering the second dose of vancomycin based on the prescription order, we then have to check the trough level before the second administration to make sure that the medication level in the patient blood is not too high. Okay, if it's too high, we then withhold the second 
uh, um, the second um, administration of the drug. So uh, Professor Lanessa might put it in applicable questions like, um, what do we do before we uh, administer vancomycin? And we have to specifically know when to do the trough and when to do the peak level, okay? Next is the osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis, this is uh, getting worse over time. It's like the pain in the joints. This primarily affects large joints. Uh, these including the back, the hip, and the pelvis. So uh, the patient uh, joints get very stiff and the pain get worse as, is, as, well as they use it. Uh, late stage of osteoarthritis, like they can have significant pain even when they resting or sitting down uh, this or when they rest and sitting down they're still having pain and it won't help to uh, alleviate the pain compared to when early stage when um, whenever they experiencing pain they can just rest and the pain will goes away but late stage it doesn't Crepitation is a very big key assessment findings for osteoarthritis. So um, this is the sound of the bone on the bone when the bone rubbed to each other. And um, something else to remember about osteoarthritis is its effect asymmetrical, meaning it can affect um, um, on one side, uni, uni on one side only. It doesn't affect both sides like the um, rheumatoid arthritis. So we exercise, we do aerobic exercise, do a lot of range of motions, uh, quad tricep strengthening support these joints, okay? Um, when will drug use? Uh, when it gets severe, a lot of pain. Um, and um, usually the drug use for osteoarthritis are just NSAID, like the pain medication, ibuprofen, aspirin. Next, we have rheumatoid arthritis. This is an autoimmune disease. Uh, so what is autoimmune? Autoimmune is the body attacked itself. So um, rheumatoid arthritis can cause fever and fatigue um, because the immune system is attacking the body. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, the patient can have significant pain, stiffness, limited range of motions, swelling in the hands and in the joints and feet. Um, it is symmetrical uh, comparable to, compared to uh, osteoarthritis. So it affects uh, smaller joints, uh, hands, feet, finger, toes, and wrist. And when it affects, it affects both sides, symmetrical. On a drift, when uh, it affects wrist and um, a drift on the outside, um, pain and stiffness get better with use. So. Um, with osteoarthritis, the pain and stiffness uh, get worse with use, whereas rheumatoid arthritis, the pain and stiffness gets better with use. Um, and the treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, usually we use corticosteroids. However, something to remember about corticosteroids is it's only used in exacerbation stage. It is not supposed to be used every single day. So if there's a question in the exam that mentioned um, which statement by the patient need further education from the nurse um, that will be um, using corticosteroids every day because corticosteroids can only use for short period of time or um, uh, exacerbation state. Uh, corticosteroid is a very uh, toxic drug. It can cause a lot of issues with um, hyperglycemia, uh, weight gain, mask infections, and um, it can lower us once immune system as well. So it's, it's not very good to be used long-term. It doesn't, it's, it's not used long-term. Next we have gout. Gout is usually occur uh, in men who are um, 40, 50 years old and who drinks and have a, a high purine diet. So basically um, because of the excessive intake of the purine in the diet, the body unable to break down the purine normally, um, Usually the body makes uric acid when it breaks down the purines. This cause, so when there's significant amount of um, purines, the body will, when it breaks down these purines, they will have a significant amount of uric acid. And uric acid is a very acidic 
um, aging uh, to be in the blood. So um, when we have an overproduction of uric acid, um, uh, which are like these pointy crystal that can get formed and deposit in the joint. Um, so it becomes very painful and usually the patient get a lot of swelling, um, redness and, and warm. Um, so obviously we're going to teach the patient to avoid puring food. Um, these including shadines, mushroom, anchovies, asparagus, alcohol, red meat, kidney, liver, like organs meat. Um, so please remember these puring food. Um, it will be on the exam. Like I'm like 90% sure. Treatment for gout is allopurinol. Um, this medication tell the body uh, don't make too much uric acid by the body. Literally, it tell the body to not make too much uric acid. So it is important to remember this medication. It will come back to you guys in method two. So let's just start studying it now. Um, allopurinol again. Um, it's tell the body not to make the uric acid and it limit the amount of uric acid made by the body. And when we don't have too, man, too much uric acid, um, then um, the kidney can filter uh, or work less hard um, instead of having to work so hard and um, there's still uric acid left over and you get deposit in joint, uh, which causes significant pain in patients. However, there is some side effect of this medications. Allopurinol can cause it rash uh, and lower blood count and lower um, white blood count to be exact. So we need to, so for, for gal, uh, we need to get the uric acid under control because excessive production of uric acid or excessive amount of uric acid in the body not only can lead to metabolic acidosis, but it can also lead to kidney failure as well because uh, it's overworked the kidney. Okay, next we have hip fractures. Hip fractures um, manifestation include external rotation of the food, food, uh, horrible muscle spasm. So that's why we give them muscle relaxants, uh, shortenings of the extremities because the deformities in the hips and bone. Um, if we don't fix it and it is displaced for too long, uh, it may lead to a vascular necrosis of femoral head. It's like the, the head of the femoral bone is going to be necrosis, like bone death. So because the circulation was cut off uh, from the fractures. Um, a lot of pain in the patient uh, has with hip fractures is because of muscle spasm. So that's why we, it is important to give them muscle relaxants. And also it is important to immobilize when they have the fractures because in early immobilization can lead to um, reduction in pain and other complications such as fat emboli later on as well. So whenever you guys have a fractures questions, the first and priority thing to do is to immobilize the patients, okay? Please remember that. Okay, next we have care for hip fractures patients. So it is important to know about this, guys. It will be on the exam and not just message one. It's going to be on NCLEX as well. I'm learning about this as well again. So um, how to care for hip fracture, fractures patients. So again, like I mentioned, immobilization is the key answer in the uh, musculoskeletal capture. Um, every fractures or um, issues with uh, broken bones, immobilization is the first and priority thing for nurses to do. Um, we can do uh, either skin traction or bug traction and use for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so the surgeon will do uh, something called open reduction surgery. This will including the use of pin, rod, screw uh, to reduce and put them back together. Um, then, uh, so let's talk about preoperative of open reduction surgery. Um, so we have to give them pain medication, give them muscle relaxants because they can have uh, muscle spasm. Uh, we then use bug traction uh, and position the patient um, so that they can have, can be operated. So next we have post-operative care for these patients. 
the biggest assessment to do when the patient interaction is to skin perfusion, like the six Ps, make sure that the patient had good circulation. And whenever we think about six Ps, um, we think about compartment syndrome. So 6P is the assessment finding in order to not only assess, assess for compartment syndrome, but also uh, to prevent compartment syndrome as well. So 6P is to look for numbness and tingling, looking for color, pale, cool, and capillary refill. refill. Neurovascular checks include constant looking at the circulation. How do we do that? We check the patient level of consciousness, we check their pulses, uh, check to make sure that they are having a constant uh, circulating of the blood. Um, neurovascular wise, they will check the pupil to make sure that their brain is getting perfused. Um, we elevate the, the um, not their brain, I'm sorry, neurovascular is also the sensation, sensation of the uh, extremities, okay, or the hips. Um, we can elevate the, the feet, the foot, but no more than 24 hours. We can keep the limb alignment by using a foam wedge, uh, help with any type of external rotations. Uh, this will help, This the goal is to try to prevent dislocation after the the this prevent dislocation after the surgery okay so how so we know that the goal is to prevent dislocation after the surgery how can a patient dislocate the fracture after it been fixed we have to know how they can dislocate it in order to tell the patient to not to do these because it can potentially dislocate your hip and then we have to do another surgery so we're trying to prevent that okay so if the patient fall again they, uh, by sitting at the side of the bed uh, and increasing the uh, risk of fall, they can have enough hip fractures or dislocate their recently surgery uh, operated hip fracture. Um, 90 degree is okay, but flex more than 90 degree will become an issue. So we don't, we can, they cannot flex 90 degree. The most is 90 degree. Okay, so they don't cross feet. After a patient has hip fracture open reduction surgery, do not cross their feet. This will dislocate the extremity so they cannot cross their feet. Um, so they try, tell them to uh, get up, go around. However, do not put too much weight bearing on it. Do not do a deadlift. Do not do all that because it can cause dislocation to occur. Um, they make sure to maintain alignment and do not bend over and tie shoes because remember that is bent more than 90 degree. 90 degree is the maximum. Um, bending over and tying shoe, shoes can cause this dislocation of the hip again. All right, next I have fat emboli. Fat emboli is a fat globul globule that breaks out into circulation system, um, usually because the, a patient uh, had some type of fractures that involve a long bone. This can be uh, tibia, fibula, femur, and humerus, radius, and also ulnar. Um, much like pulmonary embolus, a clot that lodge into circulatory system, lodge into legs, arms, and lungs. Okay, so it's just similar to pulmonary embolus, it's a clot too, but instead of a blood clot, um, this is a fat uh, clot and this originate from uh, a break of a long bone, okay? And long bone are tibula, tibia, fibula, femur, humerus, radius, and ulnar. Um, most commonly find fat emboli in patients who have long bone fractures, again, like pelvis and femur. Um, normally happen 72 hours after the fracture, so three days after the fractures. Example, patient has femur fractures 72 hours after complaining of these things. Okay, if they're complaining of chest pain, they tell us they can't breathe after 72 hours of having a fractures of a long bone or rapid respiration, meaning like breathing tachypneic. Uh, they are looking pale and blue. Um, they have a sensation of impending doom that feel like or verbalization of I'm going to die. Um, heart rate is increasing mental status changes because of the hypoxemic, um, the low oxygen um, 
perfusion to the brain because of the obstruction of the clot, um, be, um, also because of poor circulation to the lungs. Um, so those, if the patients mention that, then we have to suspect fat emboli, okay? Um, then the special one for fat emboli is petechiae. Petechiae is like little red dots that can be found on the chest area or the, um, the neck area. Um, and this can also, uh, and also um, patient who have fat emboli can have a hemorrhage sclera, like a blood eye shot. So how do we prevent fat emboli? So, Again, immobilization is the priority, is the key. Immobilization early um, is not only reduces spasm, but also reduce risk of fat emboli. Uh, what are the treatment for fat emboli? So if the patient bleeding, um, they can go to hypovolemia, hypovolemia shock, hypovolemic shock. So um, whenever we heard the word hypovolemic shock, I really want you guys to think about Low blood pressure, high heart rate, in other words, hypotension, tachycardia. Those two are the classic sign of hypovolemia or hypovolemic shock. Always remember that. And whenever we talk about hypovolemic shock, we have to remember this too. Fluid first, fluid fast. We give the fluid to restore the volume that the patient lost during, uh, due to the blood or bleeding. Um, and the fluid we give uh, in case of fat emboli is um, nor normosaline or half normosaline to, to restore the circulate volume. Um, if the patient is breathing so fast, we need to correct the acidosis because when, we, when the patient is breathing so fast, they breathe out so much carbon dioxide uh, and their, their state become um, respiratory alkalosis. So in order to uh, help with that, we can um, ease the patient anxiety, um, give them muscle relaxant, give them anxiolytic. Sometimes we also give them um, the um, uh, morphine in order to ease the mind and ease the lung so that they can effectively breathe. And, uh, and then that will correct the, um, the acidosis need of the body. Uh, then we can do blood transfusions uh, or we get respiratory support, get on oxygen or may need to get on non rebreather. All right, cast care. Cast care is important to remember and know as well. So cast is used to uh, for fractures immobilization. Often after a patient has a close reduction, then provided cast. Cast allows the patient to perform normal ADLs while immobilized, but can cause problem with writing. How, what can we do and not do? So we can elevate the lower extremity cast, but we cannot elevate it all the time. How long can we elevate above the heart of a lower extremity cast? 24 hours. 24 hours is the maximum that we can elevate um, a lower extremity uh, when they're in cast. Also, we do not want to place it in dependent position for too long. So we don't want it to elevate too long or dependent too long, um, meaning foot down or hand down, because this can cause swelling. And if they have swelling in the cast, it can cause circulation to be compromised. In other words, it can cause compartment syndrome. So biggest complication of CAS is compartment syndrome. Uh, this, is, this can be caused by swelling in the cast. It cut off the patient's circulation and patient can lose an extremity. So um, for example, we have, I have a cast right here. And if this part is started to be swelling because of um, an injury or because of, I put it in a dependent um, position for too long, it can constrict the blood circulation to my arm, to my hand, distally to the um, compartment syndrome site. Uh, then my, I can lose my hand because of um, necrotic, necrosis and hypox, uh, ischemia. Okay, so um, when take care of CAS, the number one assessment to assess for patient in musculoskeletal um, 
in general is the six piece. Um, we teach the patient if it get wet, we have then they have to dry it as well. Um, when to report to the healthcare provider or the doctor. If there is pain, we have to report it. Um, hold on. So if there is pain, you raise it first, put eye on it, medication, and give them medication like NSAID or ibuprofen or aspirin. But if the pain is still there, uh, meaning their sign, it is one of the sign of compartment syndrome, um, and the pain remains constant even after the intervention, um, then we have to report to the doctor. Um, if there is paleness, um, that indicate poor circulation. So we also need to report to the doctor. If the patient is numbness, tingling, uh, AKA parathesis, that also means poor circulation. So have to report to the doctor. If it smells bad, odor from it or the cast is hot, have hot spot somewhere, that means that indicates an infection. So we have to report it. Um, so what not to do? So if we think, if you think there's a compartment syndrome going on, meaning we, when we assess for the six Ps, they have a strong indication that this patient might be having compartment syndrome. We do not elevate it, the extremity anymore, but also not dependent on the extremity. We put it in the neutral position um, because if we uh, develop compartment syndrome is suspected, um, um, we place the limbs at the level of the herd. Elevation is contraindicated because it can decrease the anterior, anterior blood flow and narrows the anterior venous pressure gradient. That is the reason. Um, so just remember if there's a question regarding what to do when you suspect compartment syndrome, the first thing, what do you think? Report to the doctor. That's the first thing you do. Nurses don't do anything with compartment syndrome. You only assess or sign symptom of compartment syndrome, but if you suspect, then you have to report it to the doctor. Do not try to elevate it. Do not try to cut the cast. That's not your scope of practice or within our scope of practice. So we have to report to the doctor, okay? Do not get the cast wet as well. Don't ever put anything to the cast. And this, this come up so many times in my practice question for NCLEX. If we have an itch in the cast, we use blow dryer, but on cool setting, okay? Cool setting, not hot, cool. All right, next, swelling and increasing pressure within a limited space. That means compartment syndrome. A confined space, that space continues to get more and more swollen because the extremity to the constrict the blood flow uh, lead to no perfusion all the way to the end of the extremity. Um, so do constant assessment of the neurovascular system. These are the six Ps. So what are the six Ps? We mention about it all the time. So what are the six Ps? So these are what you guys want to remember by heart. Pain pressure, parathesis, meaning numbness and tingling, paler, meaning the pale and blue color of the patients, paralysis, like no movement of the peripheral activity at all, or and, and or poselessness. That is the very last stage where the patient pose is no longer there. And that is the indication of no perfusion, meaning that they will lose that extremity shortly. Um, also, capillary refill, checking pulse, weak or strong, temperature, if not getting blood flow, no circulation, the extremity usually cold. If a patient who has compartment syndrome, they will be in pain. If we give them pain medication and go back and they're still in pain and the pain is getting worse, do further investigation. We check for numbness, check for tingling, check for um, the paleness of the skin, and then check for cap refill and the pose. And if you have a very good um, like uh, evidence of uh, compartment syndrome and you suspect it, you have to call the doctor, okay? It is best to know early to late. Early signs include pain, parathesis, 
So pain and paratheas are our early signs. So if there's a question, select multiple, select all the applied, then pain and paratheas is the early sign of compartment syndrome or neurovascular check uh, or any musculoskeletal issues, okay? Um, relief, because relieving the source of pressure may prevent the progression. So the earlier, the better. Then late sign is pulselessness, can't even move paralysis, and this may require amputations. So cutting off the arm or feet. How to fix this? May require amputation, not ambulation, okay? <laughs> Sorry for the typo. Um, how to fix this? Uh, for a patient who has a cast and having sign of compartment syndrome, get the cast cut off, but have someone more knowledgeable to in that to do it, not you. If a patient is bug, using bug traction, they're also at risk for compartment syndrome. So we have to loosen the strap on the bug traction boot and don't reduce the traction. Uh, next, we have compartment syndrome. Can happen even when there's no cast. It can happen in a confined space in our skin, or it can happen because someone is wearing a very, very, very tight jean. Um, so in this case, they can do something called fasciotomy. It means that cut the skin open to allow the circulation to happen. Skin being cut and large suture are to allow confined space to open up for circulation to occur. With compartment syndrome, there's nothing the nurse can do. First priority, if we suspect a patient in compartment syndrome is to call the doctor, okay? Again, call the doctor. Okay, let's move on to bone marrow biopsy. So how do we prep for this patient? Well, listen, why do we do bone marrow biopsy? We do bone marrow biopsy to study about um, like cancer, leukemia stuff that relating to the complete blood count, um, like relating to platelet, relating to blood or um, white blood count. Um, so, we have to reduce the risk for infection when a uh, patient is in bone marrow biopsy be, uh, by doing sterile procedure. This is a sterile procedure, okay? Sterile and clean or aseptic are different. Sterile is very, very sterile. I don't know how to explain it. Um, so first we clean the area with chlorhexidine or betadine. Uh, we then numb the area with lidocaine and then make a cut with a scalpel. Uh, we then put the needle until it reached the bone marrow, withdraw the blood tissues and the bone marrow, and then there we are, we have the biopsy. So where are the sites of the bone marrow? Bone marrow um, production is occurring at the sternum and also the iliac crest. So um, these are places where the body produces red blood count, white blood count, and platelet. So um, the biggest complication of bone marrow biopsy is bleeding. So post-procedure, we have to lay the patient flat with back down, supine, and whichever side they have the biopsy on, they will put the leg of that side up for about 30 minutes to stop the bleeding. This is so important to remember, guys. Please remember this, okay? Remember, lay the patient flat, back down, meaning supine, and whichever side they have the biopsy on, put that leg on the side of the side up for about 30 minutes, okay? So that's the pose off for bone marrow biopsy. And then of course, we have to apply pressure on the wound because they are at risk of bleeding. Okay, causes of anemia. What cause anemia? So first, blood loss can cause anemia. Uh, this can be from surgery or traumatic injury like accident. Um, then we have uh, decreased production of red plus cells. So the body doesn't produce enough red plus cells that lead to anemia. So anemia is basically the reduction or, or uh, the um, def deficit of red plus cells. So um, deficient of nutrients can also lead to anemia as well. So if we have a deficit in iron, um, this can cause uh, issues with the hemoglobin synthesis. Uh, cobalamin, which is B12 vitamin, is play a role in red blood cell synthesis. So we have to have enough of that 
nutrients in order to synthesize more red blood cells, and then folic acid also play part in red blood cell synthesis as well. Um, next is can be caught anemia can be caused by the kidney failing. Again, remember kidney produces the erythropoietin, so that is the hormone that um, produced by the adrenal gland, which is the gland on top of the kidney, um, and um, it stimulates the bone marrow to produce the red blood cells. So if the kidney is failing, it doesn't release erythropoietin. Nothing stimulates the bone marrow to produce red blood cells anymore. And the patient is getting anemic. So causes of anemia continue. Um, next is increased red blood cell destruction. Um, so this is the case when the body attacked itself, the red blood cells, or hemolytic anemia, meaning hemolytic, meaning the cell, it's, it lies and it's um, it's broken, the red blood cells. And then sickle cells anemia, where the cell get uh, in a weird shape. Uh, it's like a concave uh, shape. Um, so that the cell cannot carry oxygen anymore and it's basically useless. Um, and then um, medication can cause red blood cell destruction, incompatible blood, and also hemolysis. That incompatible blood can lead to hemolysis of other bloods as well. All right, again, medication epioetin alpha. So I go over this medication already in the medication quiz. So it's really important to remember, but I'm not going over again because I've been going over so many times. Okay, iron medication, I went over in the medication quiz as well. So um, take your time and read through. Neutropenia, so neutropenia is basically low white blood count. Um, white blood count lower than 4.5, uh, meaning that the patient is currently in a neutropenic stage. Um, this is when um, um, we have to always prevent infection in this kind of patient because they cannot fight infection themselves because they don't have enough white blood count. So we, when the patient is having less than 4,500 white blood count, we then initiate a precaution calling name, um, name neutropenic precautions. So we have to meticulously uh, do hand, uh, hygiene very strictly. Uh, no fresh food, no fresh vegetable, no fresh food. No fresh flowers and also wear masks and wash hands before going to the patient room. The patient who are in neutropenic precaution cannot have uh, a salad bars or going to buffet. They cannot have shakes from fast food restaurant uh, because we don't know how well the machine uh, being clean. These patients can have canned or frozen vegetable or fruits. Intervention for neutropenia. So um, antibiotic is giving prophylactically for these patients. Uh, antibacterial, broad spectrum, antifungal, antiviral medication to protect these patients. Um, we give them something called GC. SF, this medication also known as Nupogen. So I remember, I remember I mentioned this in the medication quiz as well. So this is basically an injection that stimulates the bone marrow to produce white blood cells, okay? So what to take away from Nupogen? So we have to know when to withhold the drug. What we withhold the drug when the drug is effective, meaning that the white blood can reach over 10,000 or the neutral field count uh, or absolute neutral field count, ANC, that's the number that the professor Lunasa might use, is more than 1,500. Then we withhold the drug because it already served the job. Uh, and also this medication because it stimulates the sternum or the iliac crest. So the patient might experience chest pain or back pain or flank pain. Um, so that we have to tell them these are normal. And also, um, because this medication stimulates the production of white blood count, it stimulates the um, immune system. So the patient might experience flu-like symptom, and that's normal. We don't stop the drug, and we teach the patient that chest pain in this medication is normal. Okay, expected sign. All right. Next, we have the renal chapter. So normal EGFR is anything greater than ninety. Please remember that anything less than fifteen, meaning that they are going to need dialysis or kidney transplant. The lower the number, the worse are the kidney function. So anything less than 90 is meaning bad. 
and state of kidney disease, meaning less than 15 for dialysis needed to maintain life. Signs symptom of end stage kidney disease include fatigue, confused, blood pressure increased because too much blood volume, the kidney does not filter weight or produce urine. The patient will have edema, meaning fluid retention, swelling, because the kidney doesn't filter out sodium, so the body retains sodium. And when it, wherever sodium goes, water goes. So when we retain sodium, the water retained in the body as well, therefore leading to edema. Next, we have pericarditis because there are too much fluid around the heart, causes issues, inflammation, and um, around the pericardial um, area. Uh, then shortness of breath because there's too much fluid, it obstructing the um, diaphragm to fully um, expand in order to promote breathing. Therefore, shortness of breath can cause, and also can go into the lung as well. Then acidosis, this is because the kidney doesn't work anymore. It does, when kidney doesn't work, it won't produce bicarbonate, HCO3 anymore. And this can lead to and um, bicarbonate XCO3 anymore. And this can lead to um, issues with uh, acidosis because bicarbonate is a buffer. And if we don't have buffer, there's nothing to reduce the acid, acidic in our body. Then anemia, and again, because kidney failure, there will be no erythropoietin hormone product produced. All right, clinical manifestation of CKD, kidney unable to filter waste, and electrolytes, so retention and unable to excrete causes elevation of potassium, so the potassium will increase. Uh, too high potassium can lead to cardiac dysrhythmia. This can lead to SVT, death, and stroke, uh, supraventricular tachycardia. Again, sodium will be increased, chloride will be increased, and fluid will be increased, obviously. Uh, calcium is actually decreased and phosphorus is increased. So calcium and phosphorus always have an inverse relationship. Um, so whenever one is high, the other is low. So other waste product will be increasing as well, including urea, uh, creatine, and BUN. Why kidney issues cause it hard to fail? This is because the fluid retained in the kidney due to kidney failure causes the heart to enlarge, uh, meaning because there are a higher volume of blood, higher volume of fluid inside the body. So the heart has to work harder in order to pump uh, those significantly blood out and causes uh, higher pressure. And it just has to work harder. And when it overwork and work harder, it will get enlarged. And when it's getting enlarged, it gets ineffective. So that leads to heart failure. So drug therapy for CKD patients include, if the patient have hyperkalemia, meaning high potassium level, obviously we're going to tell them or teach them to restrict foods that high in potassium. And these are, are bananas, orange, collard green, kale, potatoes, apricot, and avocado. Please remember this. Um, Chiaxalate is a medication that can be used when LASIK does not work um, because LASIK wastes potassium. Um, but KX, but Chiaxalate is the LASIK is a diuretic where it promote peeing out potassium. Where Chiaxalate is the medication where it's make the patient poops and it's pour potassium into the patient stools and so that they can excrete it out. Um, and then next, we can use dialysis to treat hyperkalemia in CKD patients. Uh, so dialysis, again, is for end-stage renal disease, stage five, no longer put out urine, a anuria, EGF are less than 15. Um, there are two types of uh, peritoneal dialysis, including, uh, there are two types of dialysis, including peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis. Okay, so peritoneal dialysis is the dialysis that occur uh, in the uh, stomach side of the patient. Uh, it's the insertion is directly into the patient peritoneal cavity, uh, and then um, with the insertion of two bag. So one bag is the dialysis solution. We give the solution uh, to them and sit there for a certain amount of time. Then after that time, the doctor 
of which the doctor is the person who ordered the dialysis, the dialysis solution, and the dwelling time, which meaning that how long it sit in the cavity. After that, we lower the drain it back and then drain it back when it's lower than the patient, the fluid was, that was sitting, dwelling in the patient belly, we drain out the back. And that's when the dialysis occurred, the waste removal occurs. Um, so this will take out the waste product and excess fluid in the patient uh, put in, that we put in there. Uh, so there's basically three pace, phases of the peritoneal dialysis cycle. Uh, first is the inflow fill two to three liters over 10 minutes. If it's, it is given too quickly, fluid volume overload. Depressed, it will cause depression of the respiratory system, will lead to painful, shortness of breath, feeling full and painful. The dwelling time, so let it sit there for 20 to 30 minutes, uh, up to eight hours, uh, drain 15 to 30 minutes, depend on the patient. Uh, during the drainage time, we have to monitor the patient blood pressure, uh, because when we take out the fluid too quickly, meaning that we have the back too low to drain it back, uh, this can lead to uh, blood, the blood pressure to drop, headache, heart, high heart rate, uh, palpitation. In order to fix this, we can simply pick up the back higher so that we can slow the rate of the drainage down. Um, what are the complications of peritoneal dialysis? This include infections, um, infection of the actual site, this, which can cause redness, inflammation, warm pain. Um, drainage can be green and smell that indicate infection. Uh, peritonitis is also infection of the peritoneum. Uh, the, it is, this is inside the peritoneum, uh, inside the stomach. Uh, this can be uh, reflected through fever, pain, hot, sweating, a uh, biggest side effect fighting for peritonitis is to look at the dialysis fluid in the back. Um, look at the color, if it smell, um, meaning that uh, it can be infected. Um, is it clear or cloudy? Cloudy is bad. If the patient perspiration the, of the bladder, so if the person who insert the hemodialysis perspirate uh, the bladder, the fluid will be yellow. If it Perspirate the bowel, then it be brownish color, and drainage should never be red because that means bleeding. What color we want? We want straw, light, pale, page color. And then we have to have to treat the infection by giving antibiotic or using antibiotic cream. What are the considerations? So what is to remember? PD can be done at home. Assess whether the patient is able to do this by themselves. Is the patient willing to do it? Are they going to be compliant? And also, this is the most important to remember because when to increase protein when the patient on peritoneal dialysis, okay? Hemodialysis. Hemodialysis is the use of a vascular system to pull blood out and give blood back. So we use fistula. So it's important to know what is fistula and how to assess it. It will be on the exam, I'm so sure. Fistula is pulling out the blood, filter it, and put it back to the patient. Must maintain fistula site. The care of this site is so important. Like I, I mentioned, um, we have to prevent the fistula from being getting infected uh, by pro, uh, promoting proper care, uh, dressing change. If it's wet, we change the dressing, okay? Make sure the site is working. We also wait, listen to the brewery with a stethoscope and palpate for the thrill. Please remember that. Do not use blood pressure, many punctures, IV line on the side of the fistula. It is a restricted extremity that used exclusively for the uh, uh, hemodialysis. Nothing to be done on that side. Uh, usually the side will have uh, heparin in order to prevent clotting at the site. But um, that's why uh, if you are not a dialysis nut, we do not touch the site. So whenever uh, we start hemodialysis, we only have to assess blood pressure, obtain the baseline so that we can see if the blood pressure is dropping too much or too high. Um, we then assess vascular, um, assess, is it patent, assess temperature if the patient are getting affected, assess the weight, 
because the purpose of hemodialysis or even peritoneal dialysis is trying to pull all of those retained fluid in the body out. And then, so that weight is the best indicator to see if the patient is pulling off enough fluid. Then we do uh, the procedure. We do the vital sign, constantly checking the pulse and the blood pressure every 30 to 60 minutes. If the blood pressure suddenly drops so drastically uh, during hemodialysis and heart rate begins to go up, we have to decrease the rate and how fast we are pulling the blood out. Never ever stop the procedure, we just slow it down. Only give normal saline or IV fluid and lower the rate um, in shock state. So this is when the blood pressure is severely decreased, high pose, hypotension, hypovolemia, um, okay? So kidney transplantation. So this is for end of stage kidney patient, like patient who cannot tolerate um, dialysis procedure anymore. Uh, how do we care for them? We assess whether the organ is getting rejected. We assess BUN and creatinine, tell if the kidney is working. We give this patient anti-rejection anti drug and immunodepression. Put this patient at higher risk for infection, okay? Um, never stop anti-retraction drug and constantly assess if the drug is at therapeutic level. Okay, so that's something to remember too. They used anti-retraction drug for the rest of their life. All right, now we have um, benign prostate hyperplasia. Benign prostate hyperplasia is the overgrowing of tissues, enlargement of the prostate gland. Assessment is all about the urine flow. So it's important to know this assessment because there might be a select or apply questions, right? So you can ask what is the science assessment or manifestation of BBH. So this patient can have an interruption in the urinate stream and they can have nocturia, which is um, waking up at nine and peeing. Uh, they can have hesitation before urinating, terminal dribbling, feeling can't empty completely after urinating. The bladder still feel full uh, or weak urine stream. How do we treat? Oftenly we treat patient medi with medication to relax the smooth muscle and reduce the size of prostate. But those, if those are not working anymore, or there's a cancer aspect involved, we then do a procedure called TERP. Um, TERP is basically cut part of the prostate or the whole prostate out. Um, so there's a large rod is inserted into the penis and cut through the bladder to assess the prostate gland. So when we hear that it has to be cut through the bladder, there's a significant chance of infection, right? Because bladder is whole the urine and urine is a waste product. So it can it have a really high chance of infection. So as a nurse, the highest priority in PPH is to make sure that the patient is not getting infected because it is so easy to get infection. Uh, so in this case, after the TARP procedure, we have to do uh, irrigation. So irrigation is a three-way fuller catheter. Um, one line is to give the fluid constantly ir irrigating the bladder. The reason is because to prevent infection, increase the outflow and help manage the bleeding. Um, this patient is at risk for bleeding because it's cut through the bladder uh, and it is normal. However, it is normal to have blood in the urine and catheter after the procedures. Okay, so if there's an example question that's talk about um, post-op TERP and um, one of the answer choices is the nurse seeing that there are blood or the uh, the irrigation or the, the urine drainage, the urine output of the patient after TERP procedure is pink. That is normal. That is acceptable because we just have the surgery. If the if the drainage is smelly, odor, odor, and uh, green or yellow, that's mean infection. That's when we have to call the doctor. So um, it is important to know about that. 
um, overall goal is to manage the bleeding, okay? If we allow the fluid to irrigate too quickly, the blood won't be able to coagulate and it's just getting flushed and that area will never get coagulate. So we have to do it slowly, but not too slow because if we do it too slow, it causes the, the blood to coagulate and it will form big clots and it can clog up the, uh, the, the urine stream. Okay, so we only monitor drainage for the perfect color. We don't want it too dark or too clear. Pink is the perfect because there's a little bit of blood, but there's still not too dark, meaning there's no clots. Uh, okay, let me see. Uh, this is, yeah. There, I don't think this is in this chapter, so I'm gonna remove this. Um, so yeah, okay. So yeah, guys, um, that's it for the um, review session. Obviously, I cannot cover everything. However, these are the things that I believe that is important to know and will help you guys with the exam. So I recommend you guys go over this and also go over your notes, study what you have been in the class, um, doing in the class. So. I wish you guys the best of luck and do the practice questions, okay? Um, I will link it, check out the description box below and um, I'll link everything so that you guys can have the perfect resources to, to, to review, all right? Uh, thank you so much everyone for today and I'm sorry again for not doing a live section session. Hopefully by the next time I see you guys, I won't be too swell, swollen, but I might still be. Thank you again, guys. Bye-bye.